Mark Elliott, welcome to the show. I appreciate you being here today. Oh, thank you. It's nice to be here. Now, your book, Walt Disney, Hollywood's Dark Prince. This is, an, now we'll be honest with people, this is an unauthorized biography of Walt Disney, but it is a fascinating read. And Disney had a, a little bit of a dark side to him, didn't he? More than a little bit. Uh, he, he uh, I, you know, I give him uh, total credit for being an original, a genius uh, at what he did. But as with all great, complicated figures, um, they're not cartoons. They're not two-dimensional. And when I write, uh, my reputation for what it is, uh, is... Uh, how to say this tough guy, but I'm really, I'm not a tough guy writer. I just, I try to avoid the party line and write the, the truth. And I find that usually it, it's, uh, it comes out better than if you try to, to write hagiography, hey, which I just don't do. So sometimes when you write a book about Walt Disney, People sometimes are expecting Mickey Mouse, but they, they don't get Mickey Mouse. They get Walt Disney. And that, that can be a shock for some people. Uh, but that's, you know, that comes with the turf. That comes with biography. Um, you have to be able to take the hit in order to have the hit, so to speak. Now, a lot has been made about him being a Nazi sympathizer. In your research, were you able to find anything that suggests that? Well, you know, it's, it's, a, difficult, it's a difficult question for a, a lot of reasons. I did find, you know, just for background, I was able to get the, uh, the Freedom of Information, the, the, F, the FOIA uh, file uh, on Walt Disney. It took two years to get it. And when I got it, it was about 70% redacted. But still, there was enough in there to put pieces together and to contact other people who could fill in the spaces. And uh, there was a mention in the file of Disney being at a party in uh, New York City uh, where known Nazis were congregating. Now, I'm not sure what that means, uh, and it wasn't very clear because a lot of stuff was blacked out or redacted. But um, in the context of the times, it's, it's a different question than if you look at it now and say, well, he was sympathetic to the Nazis, and so was Charles Lindbergh. Uh, you know, there were a lot of people who had reasons not to want to be at war with Hitler. And uh, Disney was one of them. Uh, he, he was against the war. He was uh, an America firster. Uh, and he had rational, if not good, reasons. So in the context of... Nazism. I mean, you you could say that um, Donald Trump is a communist because he went to North Korea. Uh, in twenty years from now, people or forty years from now, people would look back and they would say, without understanding the context, well, Donald Trump was obviously a communist because he palled around with Kim Jong Un. Now we know we know a lot of things about Donald Trump. One of them is that he's definitely not a communist. Uh, so in that sense, it's hard to say that Disney was a sympathizer. Uh, let me give you a little background. Let me take a minute or two to give you some background. Disney came from the Midwest in Kansas. He got to Hollywood after he saw service in World War I where he was a Red Cross driver in France and had been wounded uh, in action. So he did see some real action. 
Now, anybody who was in World War I and that generation that followed it, that 20s generation, will tell you or would tell you if they were still alive that nobody understood why America was in that war. Uh, it, you know, it, or why anybody was in it. You know, it starts off with, a, with an assassination of uh, the Duke uh, Ferdinand and it explodes into chaos. Um, and a lot of people in that generation who then saw World War II emerge considered that World War I continued. Um, and it really was. I mean, it, World War II begins with the Treaty of Versailles. So for a lot of people who were in the war or experienced the war, World War II was not a welcome um, event. They had had enough. It was a more welcome event for people who were too young to remember what World War I was like. Now, Disney, as I say, was in the war. So he was not um, an international, uh, a fan of internationalism. He thought America should have stayed isolationist and um, the great industrial nation that it had become uh, following the Gilded Age, when uh, in the first years of the 20th century, industrialism really eventually came out of the Civil War, out of the victory of the North. That was really a war. That was an agrarian war against an industrial war. Slavery, the issue of slavery, that you know people today talk about slavery and they don't talk about what it was. It was cheap labor for the South to be able to compete with the industrial North. So, you know, so much of American history today is news headlines and people who don't really understand the significance of events. Okay, so after the war, Disney goes to Hollywood to uh, begin his film career. He want, his dream was to start a studio. The only problem was uh, when he got there in 1922, Hollywood was already carved up by uh, the moguls. They had developed a system, they made the movies, they distributed the movies, and they exhibited the movies. They owned all three elements of industrial filmmaking. And they were mostly Jewish immigrants who were chased out of the East, you know, by Edison and the Trust and all that. So they went as far away as they could. They got to Hollywood. They were buying illegal negatives because uh, Edison owned the, the um, copyright and wouldn't license negatives uh, to Jews. Simple as that. He, he, was, a, he was an anti-Semite and he, he thought that Jews had taken his invention of practicality, of historical significance, you know, to film historical events or to help business and trivialize it with entertainment. That, that was Edison's big complaint and he tried to stop it. So by the time Disney, who was decidedly not Jewish, got to Hollywood, he couldn't break into the system. Uh, the old boys club, as they called them, uh, were not looking for outsiders from the Midwest. Uh, and they didn't want to do business with him. Uh, you know, he lived, he lived and worked out of his home in Hyperion, on Hyperion Avenue. Uh, in, in East Hollywood, and that's where the name Hyperion Studios comes from, his first studios. The only way they would work with him is that if he worked for them, if he signed over all his rights to a studio, and then he would be, in effect, an employee. So the only place that would give him a shot, uh, I think, was RKO, which was always in chaos, even before long before Howard Hughes got there. It was just a chaotic, uh, one of the smaller three studios out of the eight. The five big ones, the three small ones. Columbia Pictures, another small one at the time. Uh, United Artists, which was originally an agency, music agency, which became a film studio. 
it was, yeah, it was an agency that booked musical talent. And from there, they, they got into movies. Uh, so Disney um, could not afford to make movies, feature length films. Although uh, it's not well known, but his first films were live action films. They were uh, based on the Alice in Wonderland character, Alice. And they were live action with animated backgrounds. And the little girl who played Alice appeared in dozens of these movies, uh, short films that were kind of in a Wonderland setting. And they showed off Disney's originality. They, they were quite something. I don't know where if you, could, if you could find them on YouTube. I'm not sure if they're around, but um, they were quite, I got to see a few of them quite original, quite startling, but not commercial. Nobody knew what they were, what they were supposed to be. It wasn't until 1927, I think, when Disney made a Mickey Mouse cartoon, Steamboat Bill Jr., that suddenly um, people recognized him as, as an animator. He went to animation because he couldn't afford to pay actors. So, you know, everything was done with a practical reason in those days, like today. So as a way of getting around actually paying actors, he drew his actors. And uh, he and his partner, Ub Iwerks, um, the real genius uh, in the animation department, um, created this character. And uh, um, it was a, a, a huge sensation. The problem was that Disney couldn't make any money. Uh, every time one of these cartoons, and again, if think about exhibition, you have two films on a double feature. They're each an hour and 10, an hour and 20. And then you have a, a four or five minute cartoon. Where is the money going? Out of three hours, you're getting five minutes worth of revenue. So it was not a money-making proposition. Although the other side of it was that he could turn out, you know, 10 animated shorts to one feature film. So, you know, it was, um, he, he was a very, he was the creative end of the business. So was Ub Iwerks, but Ub split from the company and Roy made his brother, uh, Walt made his brother, Roy, his partner, and he became, he was the business guy. He, he was the one who handled all the money and Walt handled all the creativity. Roy was constantly saying, Walt, you can't do this. You can't spend this kind of money. And Walt would say, well, I wanna make this movie. I wanna do this, I wanna do that. And that's how it went. Eventually he was able to negotiate a deal with RKO, where he could keep the foreign rights as a way of paying for these animated films. RKO, not being completely dumb, knew the turmoil in Europe and thought, well, we're not going to be able to sell any films overseas with all what's going on, and neither is Disney. So it's, it's an easy deal for us. Let them have the foreign rights and uh, we'll keep getting cartoons from them. Jump to 1935. Um, Hitler has come to power, but legally, you know, uh, in a crazy way, democratically, he's elected. And then he pushes out, you know, all the opposition, forces the Kaiser to, uh, to give him total power. But nobody really knows the extent of the evil, of the craziness, of you know, the, the insanity that is about to descend on um, Germany and the world, and Jews, um, and Catholics, and gypsies. You know, this was a mass murderer who had come to power legally and came to power because of the Treaty of Versailles. That's what that's what made Hitler possible. When the war ended, that treaty punished Germany and led to 
uh, a worldwide depression is really what came out of that that uh, treaty. And Hitler promised uh, the Germans prosperity and peace and uh, food on the table and um, you know everything, everything under the sun. He was going to drain the swamp, if I may borrow a phrase. So. Um, and for a while, you know, uh, he built the highways, Volkswagen, all of that stuff, which somehow today people, uh, when, they, when they're sympathetic to Hitler, they, even in Germany, they'll say, well, it wasn't totally bad. No, uh, excuse 10 million murders and he wasn't so bad. Um, Disney saw an opening. Now he had a contract with, uh, I think it was UTA, the German Film Federation, the UF, I think it was the UTA. And they, they were kind of like the national film company of Germany. But there was another upstart company that was trying to compete with UTA. And they invited Disney to come to Germany uh, as their guest in 1935. So, Disney saw the opening. He understood immediately that this was a possibility for him to get his cartoons shown internationally. So he scheduled a trip to Austria, to Germany, to France, and I think to the Netherlands. I, I have to check that. And he went with his brother because his brother, Roy, was the business guy. And you know, Walt was gonna do the selling uh, you know, the sizzle, and Roy was going to cook the steak, uh, the contracts. And they took their wives along, um, Walt's uh, wife and, uh, and, and Roy's wife. So it became a kind of a social event. While they were in Austria, it's either Austria or the Netherlands, I think it was Austria, Crystal Night happened, Crystal Night. And Roy wanted to go home. He, he said, this is not a good thing. Um, we have to leave because this is a thunderbolt and the storm is coming. And Disney said, no, 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 that's not our business. Uh, uh, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it's okay. But he went to sell his cartoons. He never met Hitler, never met uh, Goebbels, never met Goering. He met with the film companies, UTA out of courtesy, and the upstart film company. Uh, he was there for a week or two, made a deal, and came back to America. So that was the extent of the 1935 trip. Now, does that mean that uh, he was sympathetic to the Nazis? Well, what it means for sure is that it didn't, uh, it didn't offend him enough for him to cancel that trip. That the business end of it meant more to him than uh, you know, a, little, a little brush of anti-Semitism. I mean, anti-Semitism was not that difficult for Walt to understand because he didn't like Jews either. Why? Because they had locked him out of the studio system and, and he, you know, he felt that um, they kept him out because he wasn't Jewish. So he, he had certainly had his reasons to uh, not be outraged that somebody else didn't like Jews. And uh, while Roy more clearly understood the business price that he might pay for doing business in Germany, Walt said, doesn't matter. Nobody in America cares. Uh, we're not going to get into this war. Uh, this is a European thing. Let them handle it. That World War I mentality that Lindbergh had, Lindbergh was vehemently against the war. And as you know, uh, as everybody knows, uh, Lindbergh went to Germany many times and uh, met with Hitler. And not only that, but all the industrialists were not eager for America to get into that war. That's what kept us out of the war. Uh, Roosevelt wanted to get in 
to fight, uh, you know, for, to fight for democracy and all that, but also to pull us out of a depression, that uh, an economic depression. Now, war is a great cure for any economic depression because it starts the engine up. You know, you have to make munitions. You have to, you have to make steel. You have to make bullets. All of that. Um, and you know, the 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 contradictory part of all this is that the industrialists didn't want to go to war, but they wanted to do business with Germany. Germany had all the money now with Hitler. And their thinking was, we stay out of it, we do business with them, we sell them steel, we give them oil, whatever, whatever we have to give them. But let's not fight with them because we'll lose all that business. The pro-war people, besides the idealism, which is not something to minimalize, they thought the war could also be profitable, uh, which you know would get everybody working in the spirit of patriotism. And I don't mean that cynically. I mean that the idea was to uh, to get America back on track, and that the war you'd be killing two birds with one stone. You'd be fixing the economy, and you'd be killing Nazis. So. When, when uh, Disney returned, he was vehemently against that war, remembering that he was a veteran of World War I, and he saw no difference between that war and, the, and con going back into it, continuing it, it go getting into another round of insanity that would cost hundreds of thousands of American lives, which it did. Uh, so he was against it. Um, the only problem was, that Hitler then banned all Western entertainment from Germany. Um, I think he was already or about to be at war with England. So all of that was gone. And in Hitler's telescope was war with America. We, we, that was his dream. It was like getting into the World Series, you know, fighting the best other team uh, and winning. That, that was Hitler's demented dream. And so he banned all, all entertainment. He, you know, he told the people it was decadent, it was anti-German, but really he didn't want to have the West make any money out of German, uh, from German, German uh, pockets. But of course, privately, Hitler loved American movies. They screened them every night in, uh, in Germany and uh, in uh, Berlin for Hitler and up in the, up in the mountainside, um, but only for him and for his cohorts, not for the people, you know, in true dictator fashion, uh, let him eat cake and all that. Um, now he met so, with Lenny Riffenstahl. Well, that was in 1938 and uh, she came here. Uh, now Riffenstahl is such an interesting and tragic case. If you've seen the movies, if you've seen Triumph of the Will, and it's an incredible movie. Uh, it, it's one of the great documentaries of the 20th century. Reifenstahl is the kind of filmmaker that Trump wishes he had, because instead of going on Fox or CNN, which I guess he doesn't go on, or CBS or whatever, he would love to have a Lenny Reifenstahl create that kind of a, of a propaganda film for him. But that's what Reifenstahl did now for Reifenstahl. She was a brilliant filmmaker, but she made the classic deal with the devil, uh, in this case being the Nazis, Hitler. And because of that, the rest of the world shut the door on her. She came to Hollywood hoping to be able to do what Marlena Dietrich had done. Dietrich had never been uh, a Nazi or a Nazi sympathizer. And as we all know, she came to America early, uh, became an uh, American movie star at Paramount, and did a lot of anti-fascist, uh, anti-Nazi um, campaigning and programming and entertaining during the war. And it was a big price on her head. 
Hitler wanted to, to, I don't know what he wanted to do to her, but eventually to kill her. Um, but I know that before that, I think he had other plans for her. Um, so, but Reifenstahl had worked for the Nazis in these films. And while Hollywood recognized her talent, nobody would even meet with her because even to meet with her could be the end of, of a studio uh, in those days, much the way that communism, any association with it uh, 10 years later would be the ruination of the left. You, you simply could not. It was like inviting uh, Hitler to Hollywood and saying, well, you know, he, he made those roads, you know, and he, he uh, invented that car. So, the, but there was one person who met with her, one uh, established person, and that was Walt Disney. And Disney met with her. Again, there, uh, it, it's not a simple reason. When Disney was in Germany, he was constantly looking for material. Um, you know, he loved fairy tales. Uh, he loved children's stories, but there weren't that many of them um, that appealed to what he wanted to do. What he liked were all these European style fairy tales, uh, you know, with witches and goblins. Hansel and Gretel, and all of that. Pinocchio, which is an Italian story, um, and Snow White, which is, which is a, originally a, a German fairy tale. And because of this murkiness between Europe and America, there wasn't a, the kind of copyright uh, stringency that there is today. If you could make, a, if you could take a fairy tale from Germany and make it in America, and your film couldn't be shown over there, what was the problem? So that is how Disney got the story of Snow White. And the film, when the film came out, Hitler saw it privately and loved it. He, he, he thought, wow, you know, uh, dwarfs little people enslaved to this goddess. I, you know, in his own insanity, he somehow saw Snow White, purity, Aryan, um, all, all of the elements of fascism he saw in, in the fairy tale. And uh, of course, Disney saw other things, uh, uh, adoption, uh, missing father figures, uh, a prince um, taking uh, giving her the kiss of death. There was a lot of darkness. And that film was so dark that it was banned in London, in England, when it opened. Uh, they wouldn't show it in England. They thought it was too scary for children. And if you look at it today, and it's a complicated film. There's a lot in that film. And it's also beautifully made. Uh, the fellow who animated it, married the girl who posed as Snow White. And Disney was so outraged, he banned him from the studio. And that guy never worked in Hollywood again. I met him, he was still alive. Bones Howell was his name. Uh, Bones was his nickname. And uh, a brilliant animator drew all of uh, the Snow White character uh, and never worked in uh, Hollywood again because of uh, Disney. Went to jail. Went to, uh, Disney had him committed um, uh, to an insane asylum for um, that affair. Uh, it's, it's a very long, interesting story. You can read about it if you can find my book. But because Disney wanted Hitler to let his films, Disney's films, be shown in Germany, he accommodated Lenny Reifenstahl. He wanted to show Hitler that uh, he appreciated her and he wasn't afraid to um, meet with her. So uh, again, all, all of these things are linked. He didn't just wake up and say, oh, Lenny, Reifenst Lenny Reifenstahl wants to meet with me. 
Of course, you know, why not? And it was all calculated to get Disney um, an international base coming out of Europe. And Disney believed, as a lot of people did, I, I shouldn't just say Disney, that Hitler would win that war. That, that Hitler would push to a, a negotiation and he would exist, he would coexist with the West. And, and if he hadn't invaded Russia, that probably would have been the story. Uh, but Hitler was so, uh, so maniacal and so suicidal that uh, you know, he couldn't stop until he committed suicide. And if he had done it five years earlier, the world would have been a much better place. But a lot of people, you know, today we look back and say, oh, Hitler was crazy and, you know, of course he was going to lose. During the war, it didn't look exactly that way, nor did it look like Japan could lose. Uh, America, is, and people may remember the first two years of the war before it began to turn around well, were dire straits. And Hollywood, all of Hollywood, including the Disney studio, were... were was taken over by the, by Washington, and the relationship with Washington and Hollywood was never a good, one. never a good one. Um, they took over the studios physically. They they brought the, the military onto every studio, and they forced, literally forced, studios to make propaganda films. If the studios wanted to make feature films, and if you look back and you do a little research, you'll find out that the number of features made during the war years is small compared to before the war, you know, 1939 and that overrated year, and 1945, six, seven, eight, when a million movies came out that whose production had been slowed or stopped because of the propaganda war. And, you know, once, once the war officially began in 1941, Disney's dream of um, being Hitler's showcase for American film was over. And he made, you know, he made some very famous uh, anti-Hitler, anti-Nazi cartoons, the Fuhrer's face and and, uh, Education for Death. What's that? Education for Death. Yeah. Uh, you know, Columbia, Frank Capra, Why We Fight, uh, John Huston, all of these filmmakers, John Ford, uh, they all devoted themselves to making uh, the American public believe in that, in that we could win. And of course, when the war turned around, last two years, um, Hollywood took all the credit. I mean, you know, <laughs> as Hollywood will do, it, it took, well, we were the ones, you know. And, um, and Disney, of course, tried to downplay his involvement. He, he was never, uh, he always made note of the fact that the government insisted was the way all the studios put it, insisted that um, they make these propaganda films. And, uh, um, and they did. And uh, that was the war effort. But for people to say that uh, because of all of what happened with Reifenstahl and the 35 trip, that Hitler was sympathetic, I think is a stretch. What, what Hitler was, was um, uh, like everybody was. He was looking to make money. I mean, was you mean, uh, you mean Disney? Disney. Uh, what did I say? I'm Hitler. Sorry. I'm sorry, Disney. Um, it, you know, uh, Ford, um, big anti-Semitic. You know, Henry Ford, the international Jew, uh, that whole thing. Um, General Motors. I mean, every company uh, was involved during the war. They were selling munitions to the other side. So the war was something for the people, but not, not for the business side of America. It just continued to make money. Uh, you know, similarly today, um, where uh, you hear the president 
con condemning China and for the Hong Kong stuff. But meanwhile, business going on between China and America. So, you know, it, it, there's a difference between selling something to the public and selling product to the other side. That's just the way it is, it's the way it's been. Um, you know, and during Vietnam, um, there were there were supplies being sold to the North indirectly through other countries that were supplying uh, the North, not and China, but indirectly. I mean, Canada had dealings with China. Uh, France, of course, had dealings with China. Um, we didn't directly, but we did indirectly. So, you know, history is a funny thing. And uh, I always say when I speak about film, that film is not history. That if you're looking to learn about history, read a history book. Right. Film is about cinema. It's not the story, it's how you tell the story. You know, all this nonsense about Gone with the Wind is a perfect example of what I, what I mean. Gone with the Wind, nobody watches Gone with the Wind, then or now, uh, because of a, of a melancholia for antebellum uh, South. Most, nobody was born during uh, antebellum South when that film came out. And secondly, it really is a backdrop for what is essentially Hollywood's strongest point, a love story. People wanted to see Clark Gable and Vivian Lee together. That's why when you see the poster for uh, Gone with the Wind, the famous one with uh, Clark Gable embracing Vivian Lee, you don't see crosses and you don't see slavery. You, you see what people want, which is a love story. And uh, if you're going to condemn Gone with the Wind, uh, what about Yankee Doodle Dandy and the, uh, the minstrel scene that uh, is in the middle of that? What about the Jolson story? I mean, what about every Hollywood film in the 30s and 40s that relegated black people uh, to either maids, servants, butlers, people scared of their shadows, or mentally retarded, uh, you know, or who couldn't put a sentence together? I mean, that's the history of Hollywood. I mean, that is where you find a, a social history that you can't erase. That is there. Um, but it is certainly not um, uh, um, history in, in, a, uh, in an academic sense. And, and so when we say that Disney, uh, when some people say Disney was sympathetic and they're in, uh, in The Three Little Pigs, in the original version, one of the people who comes to the door to try to get in and eat the pigs is a wolf, is the wolf, but the wolf dressed as uh, a Jewish pet. And, um, a, you know, the, the wolf's nose and, and all the stuff, the hair on the side, all of that was done and Disney didn't think anything of it. He thought it was funny. Uh, you know, of course, he's, that's what Jews look like. Uh, and they're, and they're, they're sneaky and they're wolfish and, they're, and you know, they want to eat non-Jews. You know, all, all that stuff. Uh, um, and it was taken out because of the uproar, you know, by the other part of Hollywood. The Jews in Hollywood were in an uproar about it. And, and because Disney wanted to do business with them. He took it out, but he didn't take it out because he had an uplift in his moral code about uh, anti-Semitism. But you have to understand that that was not the only anti-Semitic film. Um, you take a look at Gentleman's Agreement, you know, the great Kazan film. Judaism was such a verboten topic in Hollywood because Washington was essentially anti-Semitic. Part of the problem that Hollywood had was that Hollywood was always on them uh, because they were a bunch of Jews making uh, movies. And that's why you see almost no government in films 
in the 30s and 40s. It's all about Fred Astaire and dancing and, uh, uh, you know, uh, lovers or war effort. Everybody is insanely patriotic in, in studio films. And every film has, no matter how unbelievable, a happy ending. Because that was the formula. Patriotism and a happy ending. And one will lead to the other. So there was a lot of conformity in Hollywood out of fear of Washington. And you see, you, you see eventually Washington found a way in uh, with HUAC and um, the hearings. And what were they? They, they were, they were it, was, it was blatant anti-Semitism. It was a way to wipe out an industry, which they did. So Disney is not the only villain in the case, if in fact he's a villain at all. Um, but he was anti-union, vehemently. The biggest strike that ever took place in Hollywood took place on his lot. And uh, it, was, it was pretty rough stuff. You know, he thought that because he, he had the people who worked for him call him Uncle Walt, that he didn't have to pay them because it was a family. It wasn't a business to them. Uh, and when they struck, he took it personally. And that strike, that strike changed the face of Hollywood in 1940. I mean, that was a serious, tough, um, at times violent strike. And a lot of people have said that the best part of my book was um, the, uh, the part about the strike. Because one of the people I interviewed, Dave Hilberman, I think was his name, was one of the strikers and he kept a scrapbook of everything. And I found him, he was living in the woods up in San Francisco with his wife in an unheated cabin. This had been one of the supreme animators of the Disney studio. When Disney testified at HUAC as a friendly witness, he named three people. One of them was I think it's Dave Hilberman. I'd have to check the name. I'm pretty sure that was his name. As a communist. And the reason he named him as a communist was because in 1920, Hilberman had attended the Moscow Art Institute studying animation in 1920. And he was one of the leaders of the strike. So Disney, uh, you know, we have... Uh, a president today who is known to, middle, to be a little bit had, had turned against him. So uh, Hilberman's career was smashed, Bones's career was smashed, and one other person uh, who was named, who was the leader of uh, the strike movement, his career was... Uh, Babbitt. Art Babbitt. Art Babbitt. That was who Bones was. Art Babbitt. Oh, okay. And there was an there was another guy who uh, who led the strike. Who then led another strike in '45 against Warner Brothers. Um, who never worked again in uh, Hollywood. Oh. So you know there was a war within a war. Did they happen to be Jewish? Yes. Um, I you know Babbitt was still alive when I wrote the book, and I went to his house. And I, I spent, uh, I think, half of the original nine old men, which were the, the big animators. And uh, they were named the nine old men after the Supreme Court. Uh, and they were considered the untouchable geniuses of the Disney studio. I interviewed them, uh, the ones who were still alive. And most of them uh, had some pretty wild stories about working for Disney. But Babbitt, who had committed the crime of marrying uh, Snow White and was then committed to an insane asylum, was doing, was, was uh, drawing greeting cards to make a living. This had been the guy who had drawn a lot of uh, Snow White. So, you know, there, there are a, a ton of these stories, uh, not just about Disney, 
uh, about uh, so many people in, in what that period of Hollywood was about. And yet, on screen, everything was beautiful. Everything, you know, was, that was their product. Their product was an unquestioned idealism, uh, extreme romanticism without sex, and um, inextricably happy endings. That was the formula that you had to follow during studio times.